Here we go. That's me. Cool. Here we go. We are successful. Now, um, I was here invited here to talk about the developer platform of Office 365 and uh, the Microsoft 365 developer platform. This is not going to be a deep dive on the code. So if you're not really into the development, but you want to understand what's possible or within your company, what can be done within the platform, within this awesome cloud platform what we are having in Microsoft, stay in this room. If you, however, are not interested on the platform at all, feel free to also leave. It's absolutely understandable. That's why we had two different keynotes uh, when we start this morning. Now, my name is Desa uh, I work as a, uh, in the SharePoint engineering, and my responsibilities are uh, the dev community, our developer guidance, our documentations, our samples, and everything related on open source in SharePoint and OneDrive uh, area. So I report uh, directly in the management chain to Adam and Jeff uh, in the Redmond organization. But I also work together uh, closely with the community. Uh, so we have a PMP at our Patterns and Practices team, who is the, my virtual uh, colleagues. We will work together, together with you as a community. Now, before we actually get started on the, on the development platform and deep dive on the development possibilities within a Microsoft Cloud, what we wanted to do quickly first is to slightly clarify what is the Microsoft Cloud and what's actually part of the cloud, so you'll be up to date on the structure. So I come from a SharePoint side, so obviously SharePoint is a big thing for me. So SharePoint is my platform. But SharePoint actually is part of a bigger, uh, bigger theme or a bigger term called Office 365, which is then part of a bigger cloud uh, section, so to say, which is called Microsoft 365. So as part of Microsoft 365, you get Office 365, Windows 10, and then the enterprise mobility and security. And probably the easiest way to explain this uh, is to quote our uh, CIO, uh, Satya, uh, who actually in May this year explained the structure of Microsoft extremely well. So we're basically focused on two massive platform opportunities, one being the Microsoft Azure, and the other being the Microsoft 365. And that kind of clarifies the structure of Microsoft. So there's the Azure side of the uh, group, and then there's the Microsoft 365 side of the group, where I belong uh, as, a, as part of the SharePoint team. But just making sure that I don't actually fail on messaging, messaging also the Microsoft 365 developer platform, let me invite our uh, marketing director for Microsoft 365, Mike Amelan, to explain and demonstrate this platform in practice. Thank you, Vesa. Right, so what is Microsoft 365 as a platform under the covers? Well, really, we think about it as two opportunities. First, you have you know, this capability for all the Microsoft 365 experiences, talking about applications like SharePoint and Teams and Word and Windows 10. You can extend those experiences. You can build on top of them. If you think about all the time that you and the employees that you work with and your colleagues spend inside of an application like Outlook, hours and hours and hours, potentially a week, if you can improve the productivity of that experience, you can really transform how people actually get their jobs done. Uh, and it's really the same thing across applications like Teams and SharePoint, of course, as well. Now, a common facet of this is that these applications are all designed to be extensible. You know, SharePoint has a great uh, model where all of the extensions that we build as a first party for uh, SharePoint are the same platform that you can build on. And we're looking to spread this across all of the Microsoft 365 applications. So opportunity one, extending Microsoft 365 experiences. Opportunity number two is that as you build your own web applications and mobile applications and applications on iOS and Android, you can take components of Microsoft 365 and actually go and embed them into your own applications to make them more powerful, more contextually aware, uh, and more connected to all of the employees in your organizations. So what you'll see across all of the different applications of Microsoft 365 is that we have this kind of dual use capability. If you take Outlook, you can extend and you can build into Outlook. You can add add-ins. You can really uh, change how that functions. You know, so many people, like I said, they, they work out inside of Outlook. But you can also take the calendaring capabilities. You can take the ability to work with email into your own application so that if you want somebody to take an action to get something done, right from the middle of your iOS application, you can actually you know, add a button that says, go schedule a meeting, and make sure that people reserve time to go do things. 
So some common elements of this are components like Microsoft Graph, um, Azure Identity, and also the foundation of Microsoft 365 Trust. You know, because that's central to all of the applications we build with, when you build these integrations into your own application, when you build your own applications into Microsoft 365, you get those benefits as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk through a couple of uh, different examples. Now, we have a couple of sessions later on. Uh, Bill Ayers has a session on Microsoft 365 later today. I have a session on Thursday, but where we'll go into a lot more of these snippets and vignettes and envisioning. But we're going to focus on a couple of examples of those two types of ways that you can really work with Microsoft 365. Um, first is healthcare team huddles, and the second is uh, a group, uh, an application that we have on top of Windows 10. So let me go switch over to the demo machine, like so. And so the first application I'm going to take you into is the uh, is an application inside of Microsoft Teams. So we actually have been working a lot in, in the space of healthcare and working with doctors and clinicians to understand how they do productivity. And maybe not surprising, but it turns out they use a lot of paper, they use a lot of you know, whiteboards, old-fashioned processes. At the end of the day, they take all this paper, they have someone who transcribes it into a computer system, and then the next day starts, and people are given pieces of paper to tell them you know, what patients to go check up on and do those kinds of things. And so when we worked with these hospitals, we found if we could take teams and actually just focus it and give the, the doctors and the clinicians the tools that they need in one place and make it super easy for them to actually go find all of their tools and work with them, it would actually help them quite a bit. So of course, when you come into Microsoft Teams, a foundational element is the conversations that you see. Um, and then, of course, that you can work with files. And of course, behind the scenes, that's Microsoft SharePoint that serves up all those files. But there's also this concept that you can add your own extensions directly into uh, Microsoft Teams as well. So this is a custom dashboard. And you know, if you think about a lot of healthcare teams, they work a lot like development teams. They pull together these daily scrums to actually go figure out some of the top issues that they need to go resolve. And here, right si inside of my Microsoft team, I have a metric dashboard. Um, so this metric dashboard shows you know, some emergent issues that they're seeing inside of their you know, uh, operating centers and those kinds of things. The number of infections is maybe you know, actually increasing. Now, behind the scenes, this is a custom-developed dashboard um, that, that was implemented. Um, but we'll talk about a number of different ways that you can actually go and implement uh, extensions into Microsoft Teams. Now, of course, this space also brings together other tools like Microsoft Planner and tools like Power BI all in one place. And so this really makes the difference for those doctors and clinicians that they don't have to remember four or five separate URLs. They don't have to have five separate applications on their phone. The fact that they can come into Microsoft Teams, they see everything in one place, is, is really a key differentiator. Now, another thing that they're using is just a bot. So, for example, when they're on a go, and if they have an idea, um, you know, I have an idea for actually you know, doing something about those infection rates, they can start a quick chat with their bot, and what the bot will do is give them structured conversations back. So, in this case, I can say, you know, add more gauze pads. You know, maybe one way to actually stem the rate of infections is to stock more um, gauze pads in our operating centers. Um, what the bot will do is it'll use something called adaptive cards to actually structure responses back to those doctors. In this case, it'll ask me, you know, what kind of metric are you trying to actually go influence? Um, I can choose who to go assign this action item over into and when that person should go get it done. And behind the scenes, what it'll do is it'll put calendars and events and tasks in the right people's plate. So, like, just like that, uh, again, if I'm on the go, if I have an idea, rather than scratching out a sort of a post-it note or on a whiteboard, I can actually have a quick conversation. Now it's entered into Office 365, and now it's ready to be acted upon and worked on. Now, behind the scenes, just very quickly, um, if you actually look at the code for this, this is actually a solution that you can download. It's in GitHub. It's called uh, you know, Healthcare Team Huddles. Uh, it's actually in use in hospitals today. And what it does is it actually implements it you know, behind the scenes on top of SharePoint. So it's actually using a SharePoint list to go structure and store all of those ideas, all of the metrics, and all the things that you see that are going on. So it's leveraging the foundation of Microsoft 365 to actually build the solution. Now let me show you just a very uh, a different, a different example. So in this case, what I'm going to show you is a Windows 10 application. And so Windows 10, too, is really adopting a lot of the development practices, a lot of the technologies that you see across Office 365. So in this case, this is a universal Windows application. It uses XAML. Um, it's got some nice animations and those kinds of things. But what we've done is we've built some Microsoft Graph controls for a universal Windows platform that make it easier to actually embed Microsoft Graph into your own application. So this is an example of 
how you can actually take components of Microsoft 365 and actually build them into your application. Now, in this case, I have a number of different uh, clinics like this. Uh, so I'm going to go drill in on the Seattle clinic over here. And so the first thing that you'll see when you actually come into this, besides you know, the map, got to love maps, um, is that on the left-hand side of the application, you've got this task list. Now, this task list is an embeddable component that you can get from the Windows Community Toolkit, another community source project, and it directly connects back to a Microsoft 365 planner task board. So again, you can just embed those tasks straight into your application, and you, know, you don't have to worry about the storage. You don't have to worry about how it's managed, because it's all just a part of Microsoft 365. Now, other facets as well, um, there's, a bit, uh, there's a small little chat application here that pulls in uh, you know, conversations from Microsoft Teams. Um, but one other really nice component that we have in the Windows Community Toolkit is a way to quickly embed files inside of your universal Windows application. So in this case, um, I've got some MRI files. Uh, everybody loves M MRI files. But what I'm doing here is um, I'm actually taking advantage of OneDrive's preview capabilities to take this file format for x-rays and actually leverage them inside of my universal Windows application. So this component, if you just take a very brief look at the code behind the scenes, um, you can see that what I've embedded here is just a, you know, one line of XAML inside of my existing application to connect to a planner task list, and one line of, well, a few lines of XAML over here to embed that files control. So these are some ready to run, nice and easy to use controls. Uh, in the mic, just to pinpoint this in a mic demo, can you go back on the task list uh, and the task uh, moment? Oh, sorry, the, the planner control. Um, taking me to, out of my demo steps, yeah, okay. Taking, yeah, I know. All I know. right. Yeah, sorry for messing your no, script. No, it's okay. So can we go to the Visual Studio? Yeah. Um, and if I click here. Um, how do you know that he's a old school developer, by the way? It's a white background in Visual Studio. Uh. Now, um, <laughs> So one thing to pinpoint here on, the, on this, uh, on this um, let's say, story is the fact that if we think about Planner, if even though you wouldn't like the Planner UI and you wouldn't use the Planner using the web, uh, web uh, UI or the, the, the mobile devices, you can take advantage of the underlying capabilities of Planner. And by using these controls, because they are basically then talking to the Planner, which is behind of that uh, group which is then uh, tying all yeah, of these right. elements together. So they're kind of a data storage structures yeah. for your application, even though the end user never goes to the actual group or actual planner UI. Right. Every healthcare clinic is associated with a group. And then because of that, I get all of the magic SharePoint files, planner tasks, team conversations. Um, they all are components that you can then go work through and embed. Just another couple of quick examples. Um, you know, Excel is actually a very powerful calculation engine. It's you know, the most pop popular tool for doing data analysis. And you can actually, in Microsoft Graph, actually call into those APIs directly, um, as you can see here. And you can actually update values inside of workbooks, have it recalculate, and then go embed that data inside of your application. So again, another component in a building block. But let's just take a, a, just a, a shift gears a little bit. Now let's just say for a second I actually want to go contact a patient. Now going and contacting a patient is something that's very sensitive. You want to make sure you do it with the permission of the uh, doctor who might own that particular patient. So in this case, I'm just going to start a very quick workflow process to get the right permissions to do it. Now, what happens is that process will go send an email to an approver. And when that approver gets the email inside of their inbox, um, I'll just focus on this one in the short time. What they're going to see here is something called an actionable message. So this actionable message actually has, uh, you know, I'll just click on the one that I just got. It actually has something called adaptive cards in it, which are miniature forms that I can embed inside of my emails to make them more actionable and productive. Again, if you can save people from having to switch to a different desktop, a different web browser, sign in, log in, use a different tool, imagine this on your mobile device, you actually really transform productivity. In fact, we actually deployed an approval process using adaptive cards at Microsoft, and it took our approval time from six days down to 17 hours. So it really transforms exactly everything that you do inside of productivity. One last thing I want to show is, you know, again, Windows is, is adopting a lot of these technologies of Microsoft 365, and one of them is Graph. And so, for example, the task view inside of Windows, um, if I want to switch between applications, it now has uh, a technology that takes adaptive cards and actually shows them straight inside of the task view. So in this case, um, I was looking at an EKG repair item earlier today. Um, when I click this, this is adaptive card. I can customize the look and feel of it. When I click this, it actually takes me back into the application in the right context. So whether I'm using this on my mobile phone or whether I'm using this in Windows, it always keeps it in context. And this is all powered by graph in addition. 
And so just one last call out with adaptive cards. Um, it's really just a simple JSON format. So whether you're building a bot inside of Teams, whether you're building something for Outlook, whether you're building something for Windows, they all share the same technology of this JSON format and then plus all of the web technologies as well. So that's a very quick run through of Microsoft 365 as a platform and two of the opportunities, um, both extending Microsoft 365 and building Microsoft 365 into your application. Now, SharePoint, of course, is a part of Microsoft 365, but it's a really special part. Um, why? Because it serves both the websites and the web content all across Microsoft 365, but in addition, it's got the files. And so everything that you see here uh, from here on out about developing for SharePoint is a great foundation for building these experiences across Microsoft 365. Yes, sir? Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. So I definitely would have been able to do as good job of explaining the whole platform uh, in a matter of those minutes. And Mike will have a separate session later today, if I'm not mistaken, uh, related on the Microsoft 365 platform. And he will then explain more of those opportunities. But it's a really great way of the, the demo what he showed is available as a source code. You're able to pull it down. And it shows how you can use those data objects inside of the Microsoft 365 as a storage. It doesn't mean that people need to necessarily access the information using the browser or the web, uh, you can, you can, or the mobile, you can actually build your custom UI for exposing and accessing those data objects. Now, from this moment forward, we're going to concentrate more on the SharePoint side of, this, uh, side of the journey, uh, because this is SharePoint, Office 365, and Azure uh, conference. But SharePoint is really also uh, really close to my heart to do obvious reasons. Now, on the extend and develop, um, actually, Jeff Tieper said it really well already uh, in his part that the SharePoint is intended to be extended. It's, there's awesome capabilities, there's great capabilities out of the box, but we all the time keep in mind that maybe if the out of the box capabilities do not fit on your organizational needs, you're able to extend those, you're able to adjust those, you're able to extend using JSON, you're able to extend using code if needed, and there's always an API surface. And in the SharePoint, uh, it's really uh, the modern SharePoint side of the, of the house, so to say. It's really around building these elements using the SharePoint framework, building those two uh, familiar web parts, but use, building them using the SharePoint framework technologies, and also uh, building SharePoint framework extensions like headers and footers and other elements in the pages. So it's not just about the web parts. Um, and then using the Microsoft Graph as the underlying uh, API surface to access the contextual information of the user. So accessing, for example, information like my recent documents, or my recent files, my recent elements with what I've been modifying. Now, on the last, uh, let's say, what was it, 20 months uh, since the GA of the, of the SharePoint framework, the adaption has been overwhelming. So we've been completely unexpected. Well, it wasn't completely unexpected, but the growth has been uh, phenomenal. So if we think about from year past last year, when we were having a keynote of SharePoint, uh, SharePoint conference, we talked about the success of SharePoint framework already at that point. From that moment forward, one year forward, we crewed the adoption of 474% on SharePoint framework usage. So basically, custom third-party components or customizations, web part and extensions, built using SharePoint framework. After the GA, uh, which happened 20 months ago, we've been already having eight major SharePoint framework uh, releases and updates. So first 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and so on. We're now at the version of 1.7, which enabled a lot of awesome capabilities to further extend or further expose your business objects in the SharePoint context. Now, for those who are not necessarily super familiar, uh, what is the SharePoint uh, framework in practice? Wanted to have a quick clarification. If you come from more from the on-premises side, or you're not really a developer, but you want to understand what the SharePoint framework is all about. So this is a modern client-side development experience. And what it means is that it's it's a lightweight web and for mobile, which means that it's natively responsive. When you implement an extension or a web part, it will automatically scale. Uh, based on the device uh, which is using that or accessing the web page. It powers our own experiences, which is a super, super important thing. So everything what you saw uh, previously uh, shown by Omar and Adam and, uh, and Jeff um, were actually powered by SharePoint Framework. So we in the SharePoint engineering, we build our stuff using the SharePoint Framework. Because there has been obviously people asking that, well, you've been releasing quite a lot of 
extensibility platforms for SharePoint, well, farm solutions, sandbox solutions, adding model, and now a SharePoint framework. Are you going to release another one pretty soon? The answer is actually no, because we're building the SharePoint, the modern SharePoint experience is using the exact same platform. So we're using the SharePoint framework to implement the, uh, the modern admin experiences, the modern pages experiences, the modern web port, exactly the same tooling. It's also backward compatible, which is a great thing. So basically, when, if you implement a SharePoint framework uh, component, a web part, using the SharePoint framework 1.0, we actually guarantee that that same component works in the future as well. So right now, if you implemented something using the GA version of SharePoint framework uh, 20 months ago, it will work in the SharePoint Online still. We guarantee that. That's part of the service what we provide for our enterprise customers. And it also supports open source tools and JavaScript web frameworks, which potentially might scare some of the classic SharePoint developers. It's like, well, you're bringing a lot of this new world ideas, which I need to learn. I'm a farm solution. I used to be a farm solution as well. Uh, but when you actually learn how to do development using this open source tooling, industry standard tooling, you're no longer limited on SharePoint, which actually increases your value as a developer as well. Plus the fact that if you're a team lead, you don't have to recruit just SharePoint developers. They are web developers. So there's, there's massive opportunities you, for you as a developer to grow and, and, bring, uh, and, and provide your skills on, on top of the SharePoint, on other areas as well, but also for other people come to the SharePoint. Now that it's no longer, there's no longer SharePoint-isms uh, like feature framework and XML-based uh, structures which nobody was able to understand. Well, I did, but not that many people understood them. Now, um, moving on and on to this journey, one of the big things which Adam actually showed as well is that we, we combine the Microsoft Teams and the SharePoint. So you can choose is for your collaboration, is the Microsoft Teams uh, better or is it that the SharePoint website which you are using there? The SharePoint is absolutely the location for your pages and content and collabor uh, corporate communications. So we're making this integration between SharePoint and Teams uh, all the time better. And like we saw in the, in the previous keynote, there was a little great capabilities around exposing pages and sites and files inside of the Microsoft Teams if you wish to should do so. One of the new things which we uh, released uh, two weeks ago is the SharePoint, as part of SharePoint Framework 1.7, you can now build a solution which can be then exposed as a web part or as a Microsoft Teams tab. And you don't have to do any modifications. It's the same solution, and you choose, are you going to expose that as a web part or as a Microsoft Teams tab? And that's a great, great, great capability. So to be able to understand what it means in practice, let me invite here my really good friend, Luca Pandinelli. Come on, do I need to jump in here? Here we go. Uh, uh, to show that 1.7 version uh, in practice. Thanks, Beza. <laughs> Okay, so let's see what it means as a developer to uh, build a solution that works both in SharePoint as a web part as well as in Microsoft Teams as a new tab. So here I am in uh, Visual Studio Code, which is my EDE, and you can see just a couple of things here. And this is a product uh, that I built. This is a solution that I built by using SPFX 1.7. So here you can see now I have a Teams folder, and here I have a manifest.json. So this file has been generated by using our Yeoman generator. And what you can see here is basically the same manifest that Microsoft Teams understands and that you will use if you want to build a Teams tab solution uh, basically in the, by using the Teams SDK. So you can see that basically we have new functionalities and capabilities that gives you the ability to build that solution that can be used across multiple tenants and across multiple sites in your tenancy. The other things that we did is basically we did the ability to integrate it, uh, the context as part of your code. So for example, here I can do this dot context. And once I've done that, I can see that I can do I have Microsoft Teams available over here. What it means by that is just like now I can code my solution and get all the functionalities and all the contextual information, no matter if I am in Microsoft Teams or I am in a SharePoint page. Just by coding over here, I'm able to understand and get the benefits and behave differently if I want, if my component shows in a page or it shows in a team tab. 
And because, of course, uh, this is an SPFX component, I'm taking care and I'm taking all the advantages that I have uh, as part of my solution that can come, that come with basically any SPFX component. So things just like Microsoft Graph integration, uh, authentication in ADL.js, and the Office 365 CDN can be used here, no matter if you are building a component that shows in a SharePoint page, in a Microsoft Teams tab, or both. So now I'm done with my solution, and basically because of that, I have developed, deployed my uh, solution here, and I created my package. Uh, here it is. So now I am going to SharePoint, and I'm going to the app catalog. Let's refresh and see there is nothing that is there. Perfect. So I am dragging and drop just like any other um, SPFX component. I am here. I am dragging and drop in the app catalog. I am deploying that solution at tenant level. And because that was part of the manifest uh, information, I can say that this solution is deployed tenant-wide. So that means that I will not need to install that solution in any site collection, no matter where I want to have that solution showing up, because that was tenant-wide deployment uh, setup does. And here it is. So make this solution available to the organization. Deploy. Now, this is basically a solution that is available everywhere. Here it is, no errors. So let's go to a page. Uh, let's create a new page over here. Uh, let's call that, I know, uh, my page is LOB solution. That's, al that's always the most difficult part of the demo. Yes, exactly that. Page name. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's search for leads, which is the name of my web part. Here it is. Now I'm adding, and you can see that works perfectly, just like any other SPFX solution, and that's what I'm expecting to do over here. So the page is published, and we are all happy. Now let's go to Teams, and let's take a look here, and let's say what it means to surface this solution in Teams as well. So first off, we said that as part of SPFX, now we have the ability to have uh, the Teams manifest being provisioned to us through the uh, Yeoman generator. So here I go to Teams, and here they define my zip file available to deploy that in Teams. In Teams, I go to the store, and I go to what they call the LOB app catalog in Teams, and I upload my application to the entire tenancy, Contoso. And from here, I basically go in this folder, and I select the package. And just to clarify again on that one, so the manifest uh, JSON file was automatically created. You didn't do any modifications no, on it. No, no. Just created for you. Sure, there are some JSON structures inside of it, and there's a settings which you can modify, but you don't have to. Uh, and then you zipped uh, the images and the JSON file in a zip file. You deploy those as part of your uh, catalog, either in a tenant level in Microsoft Teams or in a channel yep, level. Exactly. So here now it's available. Then it's the, because I. I Deployed that in Microsoft Teams for my whole organization is available to be deployed everywhere. Now let's go to one team and let's go to retail promotion over here. And basically from here, let's go to conversation. And just like I would do add any other tab in my team, I click on add a tab. And if I search for the same thing that I was searching in my web part picker a second ago, now I can see the leads uh, SPFX component available in Teams as well. I'm going to add that to the team. I am installing. And the first thing that you will note is that you will see here in a different format, because now we are in um, um, Microsoft Teams, but we are not in SharePoint. But you will see the property pane that gives you the ability to configure your component in Microsoft Teams. So now I can configure. I can select something, and then I can save. And once I've done that, you will see that automatically the same experience that you were having in SharePoint shows up in Microsoft Teams. And this is, again, by doing zero changes. I created one solution. I simply I have the opportunity to take different functionalities depending on where I am. I deployed that solution, and now that solution is available as it is in both Microsoft Teams and SharePoint. And by the way, this solution is available for you also as an open source example, uh, starting from uh, actually last week, actually yesterday. Yes. Uh, so we'll cover all of these open source uh, resources and, and components and locations in the BMP session later this week. But it's already out in a GitHub uh, for you to take advantage. Now, but, 
we didn't stop there. Because we know that uh, there are a lot of partners and a lot of customers that need to have their solutions, that provider hosted solution, and they already built uh, provider hosted Microsoft Teams tab available. And as a matter of fact, you can see here that we have a lot of partners that build a lot of solutions in Microsoft Teams. So we basically try to understand what would means for this solution to also show up in SharePoint. And basically what we did is that we built some functionalities and capabilities in SharePoint to understand Microsoft Teams. So now if you go back to the app catalog, you will notice that I have a couple of zip files, one for Jira Cloud and one for Bragg. Those are great partners that have worked together with us to build Microsoft solution, to build solution that works both in Microsoft Teams and SharePoint. And these are similar to before, Files that teams understand, and now SharePoint as well understand. So what it means in general, basically, is that now if I go here in Microsoft Teams and I have this solution, which is basically a partner solution that has been built for Microsoft Teams, I can now go... Similar kind of a, similar kind of a solution that Mike had, actually, as a customer. Absolutely, yes. Microsoft Teams. So yep. it's a solution that is hosted in yep. uh, Azure, and it basically shows up. Uh, in Microsoft Teams as a provider hosted solution. But now I can go back over here and I can go to one of these pages and the same solution shows up here as a web part. And again, it's basically functionally completely. It has the same functionalities and capabilities that you will have uh, as part in Teams. Uh, now the same package, the same solution without you doing no changes is available for both Teams and SharePoint. And the, and the Teams SDK now provide the same capability that uh, to get access to the SharePoint context when you build your solution. The last thing that we did is because we understand that such solution can have a different functionalities and different canvas capabilities through the app pages functionality that we show it up in SPFX 1.7, we are now able to have this solution be in a full page. So if I go back over here, I already made one of these pages, which is this one. And now you can see exactly the same component showing up as a full page application in the SharePoint pages canvas with no editing and functionality experience to take advantages of the full page capabilities inside our SharePoint site. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Thank you, Luca. Thank you very much. And great shirt, by the way, great shirt. Oh, likewise. <laughs> Good, so let's actually get back on the slides and move from the, let's say, product capabilities um, uh, to more open source tooling and open source capabilities. So one of the things what we've been having, uh, well, actually, before we go there, just a quick recap on that one. So getting started on, on building uh, the SharePoint framework solutions. So we would ask you to build all of your SharePoint customizations using the SharePoint framework. And the big thing to here to remember is that the SharePoint framework is supported in the classic experiences as well. So even though you would currently have your SharePoint Online in a classic experience, and you're, you're not really looking into moving to the modern, and we'll cover some tooling related on that one pretty soon, you can already take advantage of SharePoint Framework. Or in SharePoint 2019, you can build your customizations already using SharePoint Framework. So you will be future proven with your uh, extensibility investments. Also, explore our patterns and practices components. We have open source components and controls available for you to increase your productivity when you're building these components. We're going to go through some of those slightly later in this presentation as well. And also, now as part of the preview in 1.7, you can actually extend and integrate with Microsoft Teams by, by exposing the exact same web part as a Microsoft Teams tab. And that's really, really great. Now, especially for the preview capabilities, like with the Teams integration, um, you might want to test these. And you should be testing these not in your production tenant, because these are preview capabilities. They're only enabled in a targeted release tenants. But how would I get a targeted release tenant? Well, you actually sign up for Office uh, Dev program by going AKMS uh, OFFDP, and you will get a free tenant at least for one year. We're working on an automatic renovation or renew of those tenants potentially in the future. Uh, and then you are able to test uh, these capabilities not within your production, but a, a using this free tenant, which is available for you uh, from Microsoft. Now, that was kind of the, the story around the, the engineering capabilities. For us in SharePoint uh, development area, 
the open source and community is a massive deal. We've been working with community for years so already, sharing solutions, sharing uh, documentations, guidance and samples, creating open source tooling. And there's a massive amount of tools which are available there for helping us uh, on being more successful. Uh, sure. If they're open source tools, there are certain uh, roles and policies in certain companies where, where you might not necessarily be able to use them, but then maybe you can actually contact a partner who will then provide us support for the open source tooling in your case. One of the big things what we've been investing uh, recently on this open source tooling is around the transformation uh, tools. And that really comes down on the fact that we know that there are thousands and thousands of customers who've been actively using SharePoint Online, and they've been using the classic experiences of SharePoint because they joined SharePoint Online before the modern experiences were available. But then at the same time, Adam and Omar and Jeff showed you, and Dan showed you awesome, brilliant capabilities, modern capabilities, and you're wondering on how would I actually go there? I've invested on all of this classic portals, how would I do the transition? And that's, uh, that's one area where we have open source tooling available. And let me invite here my really good friend, Bert Janssen, uh, to show some of the open source tooling and magic available for you to take advantage. Welcome, Bert. Thank you, Vesa. <laughs> so let's, first of all, switch over here. Everyone in this audience most likely has classic sites. And this is an example of a classic team site. If you look at the site, it has been customized. There's a custom home page. If I click here, there's a custom page about our favorite drone, the D95, which is a fairly nicely formatted page, I would think. It has some tables, some text. It even has an Excel web part showing the prognosis of our drone sales. So this all looks good. Furthermore, we have uh, a list, a SharePoint list, uh, listing the drone editions. So we have three colors of this particular drone. And you see here the color boxes showing the actual colors. Now, this is done using a technique called JSLink, which is a classic customization technique. Now, the question is, is this site lost? Am I doomed with this site because I want to use modern? And the answer definitely is no. You can truly, fully, in place, modernize this site so it behaves the same, acts the same, and works the same like a modern site. So let's do that. To do that, uh, we are going to use a script. Um, so we have a modernized script. We chose uh, a PNP PowerShell as an approach because it gives you flexibility to change the modernization process. You might want to plug in your own uh, specific uh, needs. But quickly looking over the script, we see that we are enabling uh, the modern features because they might have been disabled uh, uh, in the past. We are installing a SharePoint field uh, customizer. So we are installing a new SharePoint framework-based customization that will replace the old JSLink one. Setting the master page back to the default one, uh, putting a, a new team, cleaning up things, modernizing the pages. So we are creating a modern site page for each and every classic uh, wiki page in the site. And finally, we uh, conclude with uh, group connecting the site, so making an Office 65 group available uh, as backend for this particular site. Now, once this script has run, we can go to this uh, Contours Electronics site. Let me refresh it to be really sure. And what you see here is the same site, but now the modern version. It has a modern home page, which really looks great. Uh, if you go to the actual page that we saw before, this is now a modern page with a modern table, Modern Excel web part showing. So everything is the same, but now you're using a modern site page. If I go to the actual list, the D95 editions, it still shows in classic, so I let's exit the classic experience, and again, modern. So the same site is now fully modern. It is also group connected, so this site can, for example, get a SharePoint Teams behind it. So this site is equivalent to any newly created modern site. Now, you might ask yourself the question, OK, you uh, changed the JSLink by a modern SharePoint uh, customization. How did you know that? I have thousands of sites. I don't know. Uh, well, we have an answer for that. We have a SharePoint uh, modernization scanner. If I go, if I find that one. Uh, ESPC scanner over here. Let me zoom in. 
I'm not going to run the actual scan, but the scan is a wizard style approach where you configure the parameters, you define how, how the scan can read all the site collections. You define which sites to scan, your full tenant or like a subset. You define scan options, and then you hit scan, and it will generate repos for you. So let's have a look at the output. The scanner does generate up to four Excel-based dashboards, one for list and libraries, one for group connect, one for modern pages, and one for publishing portals. And this portal, this, sorry, this, this uh, dashboard allows you to, uh, for example, understand, if I click on JSLink customization over here, that there are 32 lists in my tenant having JSLink. So these are 32 lists that I might have to look at before I modernize my sites. So the scanner is there to help you to understand. But you might have hundreds of thousands of site collections. So Correct. you need to understand which of those site collections I can actually transform to be modern, and what kind of, let's say, blocking factors or uh, there might be uh, related on permissions is one element. Uh, you can't groupify a site if it has a certain set of permissions. So you need to rethink those permissions in a certain way. And, and obviously, if there's a custom master pages or JS links, you want to identify those site collections, which might be a problem for you before you start actually the transformation process. Um, but that's, that's basically the scanner part of the, the story. All right. It will give you all the data that you need to prepare for your modernization journey. Yeah. Now let's shift gears a little bit. Let me refresh this site as well. So in the previous demo, you ended up with modern pages. So the wiki and web pages were transformed into modern, and it happened automatically. But wouldn't it be great if your end users could self-service uh, get a modern preview of a page and look at it and uh, then accept or decline the page. And essentially, they can. So today, we are announcing a new open source project, the SharePoint Page Transformation UI, which is a solution that enables end users to self-service create modern versions of their classic pages. So in here, let's go to uh, my classic page. Come on, loading. Here we have a classic page uh, showing um, an image gallery web part, some tables, some formatting. It has an embedded PowerPoint. It even has uh, a third party SharePoint framework web part, because you can put SharePoint framework web parts already today on your classic pages. And finally, a custom third party web part. Custom parts. third party web parts, yes. yes. So if I hit the page button, I have a new button, create modern version. So let's click on this button. And what will now happen is that uh, we go to a central page, which has a SharePoint framework web part, which makes a call to an Azure AD secured uh, function. This function will, in the back end, create the modern version of the page using the user's credentials. And once it's done, it redirects us to the created page. So voila, we have a modern version of our page with um, a toolbar on top. A banner web part, which allows you to uh, either keep or discard this page, which is important because we want to give you a choice. If I click discard, you can prevent, provide a reason why you don't like this page. This allows the IT persons in your organization to further improve page transformation to make it better. But in this case, I'm fairly OK with this page, so let's hit keep this page. At this point, this preview page is being renamed, being swapped with the old page. So this is the final page going forward. This page now has the name from the previous page. And the URL of the previous and page, the URL. more importantly. So Correct. the URL will, will remain the same. Yes. Right? You see navigation, if you click on D95 details, I end up on the yep. modern page. With that, Vesta, I would like to hand over back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bert, for that one. And Bert has a session uh, Thursday, last yes. session. Thank you. So first, uh, Thursday, uh, a specific session related on the transformation guidance. Uh, so more on that in there. If you're really into looking into what is a scanner and how you can transform, what is that open source transforming a framework, which is now available. Now, uh, if you're interested on those topics, uh, we have an AKMS SPP MP modernized URL, where you can find additional details around the modernization steps and the tooling which is available for you. But really, what we're looking into, because we in, in SharePoint, we're in investing heavily on the modern experiences, uh, we would like you to move into modern experiences as well. And if there's any gaps related on that, please let us know. That's why 
uh, Jeff is here, that's why I'm here, and Adam and everybody else in the, in the Redmond organization is here to get your feedback around those necessary uh, functionalities. Now, building uh, your customizations using SharePoint Framework, once again, repeating that, and take advantage of the provided open source tooling. If you're an ISV or system integrator, you can have a look on the tooling. It's MIT licensed. You can use that any way you want uh, in your tooling as well. So we keep all of this away for you uh, any way you want to use that. Now, um, on the last kind of a, no, well, last part, or, or one of the key peaks, <laughs> okay, let me rephrase, reset. Um, okay, so, um, not necessarily just the last part of the presentation, but one of the really big parts of the SharePoint has always been around the fact that we are creating sites. It's all around the fact that we create site collections and sites. And every single organization have their unique requirements around the policy or branding or elements or functionalities around those sites. Um, and obviously, as part of this journey in the modern experiences, we have already released, uh, Sean Squires has been leading that effort around the site designs and site scripts. So you're able to modify uh, what kind of sites are getting available within your tenant using the modern experiences as well. All of that site designs and site scripts, actually the, the, the ideas and functionalities behind of that are kind of a coming from the open source uh, tooling, what we've been building together with community. And, and really the site designs and site script, it is an awesome capability, but it still concentrates on the site level. What if you would like to have, what if you have a SharePoint solution, a, a structure which you want to have deployed to multiple uh, tenants? You want to have stuff from your uh, bucket to multi site collection solution to get away with customization. I want to take it from our pre production or deploy that to pre production and exactly the same multi site collection level structure to my production. I want to make sure that the configurations and taxonomies and, and permissions are all actually uh, identical between the tenants. And that's where actually our new, uh, uh, and new capabilities in our open source tenant templating will help you. And to be able to understand what that actually means, let me invite my good friend Erwin van Hoonen from Rencor uh, to see this one in practice. Welcome. Good morning. So approximately one and a half years ago, Microsoft introduced the side designs and side scripts. And as, as Vesa already mentioned, um, they provide great functionality, but they are limited to a site collection. So if I'm here in the SharePoint I wouldn't home, say limited. They're by design to a it, site. It's a way so, of doing it. So careful now, Irving. Careful. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Sean is on the audience. Jeff is in the audience. You Sean, need to be careful. Don't find me afterwards, yeah. please. <laughs> so if I create a new site collection here, like a team site or communication site, so this site designs and, and site scripts only apply to modern sites. When I create a new team site, I can select here from a site design that I provisioned to my tenant. Now, as Vessel already mentioned, what if you want to repeat this work with creating site collections, or if you want to like, create multiple site collections, you want to do that in a structured way. So we took the, the PNP provisioning engine, and we changed the scope a bit. Now, those of you, and I'm sure that many in the audience already used the PNP provisioning engine, but the PNP provisioning engine was very much focused, again, just like site designs, on a single site collection. And we always required you to create that site collection first. The engine did not do that. That was for some people a bit confusing. Why doesn't the engine create it? Well, we, we changed the scope now of the PNP provisioning engine, and we introduced something called tenant templates. So if I move to a uh, tenant template, and let me find the correct here. This is a tenant template. And the, the tenant template introduces a couple of new things. And we, re we released this um, like two months ago. Um, and this will actually grow in the future. I'll get back, back to that later. Um, we allow you now to, for instance, provision themes to your tenant. We allow you to provision taxonomy to your tenant. We allow you to provision site scripts and site designs to your tenant. Here, for instance, in my template here, which is very alike a PNP provisioning template. It's effectively the same schema. Here, I uh, upload to JSON files. We do not want you to embed JSON and XML. That would be just ugly. Um, so we refer to the JSON files. And here I provide site designs where I actually refer to those uh, specific site scripts. So would I run this template through PNP PowerShell, it would create those site designs and site scripts for my tenants, and I can reuse them from the SharePoint home. So this is basically an admin operation to making sure exactly. that I want to deploy my site design and site script. I could yes. use SharePoint Online PowerShell for it, but uh, I can tie in more than the site designs and site right. scripts in a right. single template. You could imagine, for instance, a situation where you build a template like this and you give this to your customer. So you do the work at home, 
you give it to the, temp the customer and they run this template against the tenant and all the files and all the site designs are there. They do not have to run any potentially complex PowerShell commandlets. Then what we also introduced here is the sequence. And the sequence allows you to create actually a sequence of site collections. That can be site collections, can be subsites, can be 25 site collections, it's up to you. The engine will create those site collections and you can associate those site collections with a PNP provisioning template or a site design, that's up to you. So um, in this case, for instance, in this example here, I refer to two templates. So we basically create the site collection first and then we apply the two templates in sequence. Where are those templates, those templates located? They're actually, if you scroll a bit down, they're located in the uh, same XML file. And the templates are basically then defining what kind of list and libraries and branding and theme et et and, et and et custom pages and all of that is yes. available on the page. Correct. On the site, sorry. Now, the template you're looking at, the tenant template you're looking at, is actually the one that we released uh, a while ago already, and that is the starter kit template. So if I go to the starter kit, I should have it open somewhere. It's actually not open. It's one of the browsers. It's so one, of the, one, which of, one the of the browsers so is it? One uh, moment, we'll turn. So we'll find it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have so it with me? Can you see? Fine. Found it. Okay. It's my okay. eyes. Yeah. yeah. There we go. This um, is Starter Kit. So the Starter Kit is a great example of, uh, we think, a great example of how, like, how to combine all those new modern technologies that are given to you for SharePoint. So SPFX solution. Um, we have extensions, we have, for instance, here, if you look at the bottom here, there's an, a slide out menu in the bottom, that, and, and this comes all in the starter kit. The PNP provisioning engine, or the, the, the template that you're looking at, is provisioning the SPFX solutions to your tenant, is creating the site collections, applies the themes to it, um, and applies all, all the, installs all the SPFX solutions in the site. So you get like a tiles web part here, you get um, all kinds of things that are given for you. So, when you run this template against your tenant, this is what you get. And we create three site collections. So we register this site collection as a hub. We create two other site collections that are associated with this hub. So it's a great way of you of have a look at, like, what is this doing and how would I approach a relatively complex solution by looking at the starter kit like this. And so, it's not just about the provisioning and technology behind of this. So no. this is open, uh, the starter kit is open source. Just Fully open source, clear. yes. Uh, it has a 15 web part that shows also the graph integration and everything else. You can have a look exactly. on the implementation. But also for those who are not developers, it actually shows what you can do with the modern experiences. Uh, so it's a ready-to-use uh, template. Did you love it how he controls the mouse? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's ready-to-use template for you to also show what's possible within the modern experiences. You can deploy this to any tenant using the tenant templates which were shown. How do we do that? How do we deploy So that? it is actually very simple. You launch PowerShell. And if I navigate to the repo where this is all open source, as Vesa mentioned, um, and it's located on GitHub. So if I go to GitHub um, starter kit and I go to the provisioning folder, you'll find two files there. You find a um, Starter kit PNP and a starter kit XML file. The difference between the two is the XML file, well, obviously, it's the XML file that I just showed you. But we refer to all kinds of other supporting files, like the JSON files and images, and there is a PowerPoint presentation. SPPKT file in the, 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 the SPFX solution files, there are, everything is in this repo. And it becomes a bit complex if you want to distribute it to someone. You have the XML file and all the support files, and they have to be at the right location, etc. So what we did is we packaged the whole thing, all the XML files and everything, into one file, being the .pnp file, which is an Office Open XML file. And in there, we have actually everything packaged into you, uh, for you in that single file. So in order to uh, provision this, it's a simple a matter of, say, apply PNP tenant template. And you say starter kit, starter kit.pnp, and you press enter. And what we will do, um, we hard code it, of hard coded, we, we pre, um, uh, put some variables in the template, but out of the box you will get a site called um, Contoso Portal, Contoso HR, Contoso Marketing, and you can override those values if you want to by specifying some parameters on this single commandlet. So basically, you're saying that I will get a, a ready-to-use modern portal demo or yeah. a, a starter kit yes. uh, to play around and see what's possible in SharePoint. Indeed. What if I'm not a PowerShell? I don't understand what is PowerShell. Right. Why, why, what? I, I don't feel this isn't this. That seems like a development. I don't know what okay. command line you're using. Okay. So we, how do I fix that? We actually have an answer to that. Oh, we do. If we do. I, I think I knew about that. And I think you knew about it. <laughs> so announcing the PNP provisioning service. 
this is currently in a closed beta. Um, so what we will do with this service is that you see a, a bunch of templates here, and here you see the starter kit. And it's a matter of actually just selecting the starter kit and say, add to your tenant. You will be asked to authenticate. You will have to consent to some rights that we require to provision this template to your tenant. And then the provisioning service will allow you to, uh, will create those site collections. It's effectively doing the same as the apply PNP tenant template, but then we will take care for you of the ugly work, so to say. Um, we allow you to change parameters here. So you can update uh, some values. So if you don't want to have a site called Contoso Portal, but some other site, you can actually just change the site URL prefix here. You can even change the color, if you want to, of the theme that we're apl applying to your site. Now, um, around the positioning of this one, just to be clear on the, on the availability and everything else, this is right now in the really uh, small closed beta. And what we're looking into doing with this one is um, you probably noticed how Jeff promoted the SharePoint design uh, user kits, which were created for Ignite uh, 2018. So basically, the templates which we used in Ignite to demonstrate what's possible in the modern. This is not going to be open sourced uh, service, and we will provide you uh, predefined templates by our uh, design. Uh, organization app approved templates, which you're able to then apply to your template as a demo environment, uh, as a, a starting point, as a uh, uh, ideas of how we and what you can actually do within your uh, own tenants. So we're not actually, this is going to be Microsoft control set of templates uh, designed and decided by our design team, which will be then released available uh, for you to take advantage or to apply to your tenants. Yep. And right if, now, yeah. If you want to use this service yourself, you, this, the, the, the application itself behind it is being made open source. Yes, everything behind of this is open source, will be made open source, not yet. Uh, we need yeah. to still polish certain things. Uh, and then uh, we will get source code available. You, you will be able to know how to build these kind of things uh, by yourself as well. But if you need to have cool looking modern sites designed by the SharePoint uh, design team, that is what you can use uh, this one for, for demonstrating what's possible in SharePoint Online. Yep. Right now, we're looking into releasing this early next year. It is right now in a private uh, or really limited panel. One, one thing also to mention about PNP tenant templates, we indeed um, plan to extend this. So yes. like to Teams and Flow and Power Apps, it's your tenants we're talking about. So we're growing beyond the, the SharePoint site collection or to other areas that you, you use on a daily basis. Absolutely. So Microsoft Teams uh, APIs are now supporting uh, creation of teams using APIs that will be supported in the templating as well. Yep. But thank you, Irvin, for that thank one. You. Thank you. <laughs> now, I'm going to take two more, uh, to a few more slides and just to wrap up what we've been going through today. But from the templating, uh, AKMS SP DevDocs uh, is our documentation uh, location in the, in the SharePoint uh, docs.microsoft.com platform. Uh, use site designs and site script to extend the site provisioning in the site collection level or in the, when you're creating sites. But then if there are limitations or if you run into certain uh, scenarios which is not yet possible with site designs, first of all, tell us what are those scenarios. And second of all, you can extend those site designs using the BMP provision still, and then the tenant level provisioning will give you the possibility of replicating configurations in a multi-site collection level and automate really cool demos to be deployed available. Now, uh, and documentation is available, like I said, from AKMS SP Dev Docs. Uh, quickly, just pinpointing, uh, as we are in the open source uh, section of the, of the journey, uh, let's see if I can get to the following slide. Here we go. We do have a lot of other open source initiatives uh, which you probably want to take advantage in your development as well. And these are all open source, MIT licensed, so they're meant to be increasing your productivity uh, as a developer or as a ISV or as a system integrator. So we have an extension to out of the box SharePoint Framework Human Templates, uh, BMP SPFX Generator, uh, which supports, for example, Angular as the default uh, project solution to build your SharePoint Framework web parts, or Vue. And you can actually choose that I want to have a Vue or Angular-based solution. For those of you who were here, well, actually in Dublin, but the ESPC uh, keynote a year ago, we had Google with us on, on explaining this journey, what we were planning to do. And now it's available for you. Uh, you can use the Angular uh, on that side. We have reusable SPFX controls. We are uh, harvesting out-of-the-box capabilities and releasing for you reusable controls uh, in SPFX, which will increase your productivity as a developer or for your team to take advantage. We 
have Office 365 CLI. So we're able to use a command line, uh, control, command line tooling uh, cross-platform. Uh, BMP PowerShell and SBO PowerShell is only for Windows, but this works in any platform. You're able to manage your Office 365 tenant. And we also have a BMP JS client-side libraries, which will abstract the complexity of REST APIs. Uh, rather, you can do uh, spweb.list.getList uh, with the name, and then you're able to modify the settings of a list, as an example. So really speeding up again the, or increasing the productivity of your developers. Now, all of this uh, is behind of our open source initi initiative, SharePoint PMP, SharePoint Patterns and Practices, AKMS SP PMP is the one address to remember. Uh, and it really comes down on the sharing is caring uh, thinking. And we want you to be successful uh, on what you do on your day-to-day -day work. So take advantage of the things what we provide you. And also contribute back. If something is missing or you want to fix something, it is open source, it is kin GitHub. Uh, it's, a, it's the journey, and this is the direction where we're heading as a Microsoft as well. But that's it from our side. So thank you very much for joining on, uh, on this keynote. We did go slightly uh, long, but I do apologize on that. But thank you on the behalf of the team, behalf of Jeff, on behalf of the uh, Microsoft for being part of the uh, morning. Thank you. <laughs>